Hello everyone, my name is Dr Alison Lyon. I'm an academic registrar with the Department of General Practice and I'm here today with Dr Lawrence Tan Hello. and Dr Marion Brooke. Hello. And today we're going to talk about transitions in healthcare. So by the end of this session today, you should be able to describe the importance of clinical handover, recognise poor communication as a threat to patient safety, outline the minimum requirements for information exchanged at clinical transition, and describe a tool used in clinical handover. And hopefully you should be able to start developing these skills to be able to refer a patient to a colleague with confidence. So what is clinical handover? The official definition is the transfer of professional responsibility and accountability for some or all aspects of care for a patient or group of patients to another person or professional group on a temporary or permanent basis. It's an integral part of clinical care and it's practised in a number of ways in all healthcare settings every day. So who is involved in healthcare or uh, transitions in healthcare? So there's so many people that we can talk about this list. I'm not going to read it all out. You can read it at your leisure. So it's between health professionals and between health professional and other service providers. So if we think about the photo there, there's um, a doctor at the emergency department handing over to paramedics. So where does handover typically occur? So within the hospital. So you'll see it on your placements um, across different teams um, during different times of the day, across departments. For example, when a patient's being taken to theatre, there'll be a handover between um, the nurses waiting for them at theatre and the ward nurse who's gone down with them. Um, between hospitals, if you're transferring a patient between hospitals for specialist services and beyond the hospital. So within the hospital into the community, um, for example, when the, the GP has a sick patient who needs to go to hospital, the GP will often call the admitting officer at the emergency department. Um, have you had any recent experiences of this, Lawrence or Miriam? Mm. Um, so I've had some recent discharge summaries from the local hospital and um, some of them quite well done. Um, others, I think, um, yeah, they were, they were recommending that we do a whole lot of stuff which I didn't think was necessary to be done in the community and the patient kind of agreed once we've talked about that. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's important in both ways as well. So sometimes we also send people to hospital and we need to communicate with them. Yeah. Yeah. Does it happen? So you, I'm sure you'll have seen this in your hospital placements. It occurs at multiple points throughout the day. So it will happen within shifts. So if you have a patient who needs a consult from another specialty, or if you have a patient who needs an urgent CT scan, for example, then um, this, this will be usually take place in the form of a phone call. Um, across shifts, so when different teams are coming on, um, you'll notice obviously the nursing handovers, generally they have big team meetings um, at least two or three times per day. Um, scheduled handovers, as we said, shift handovers, ward rounds especially, and ward transfers, and also unscheduled. So in an emergency, um, there is a clinical handover so that everybody knows exactly what's happening with the patient. So how does it take place? So face-to-face -face or over the phone. Written, so within the clinical notes, um, within the electronic records, discharge summaries and referral letters. So formally, um, at a case presentation, for example, at a grand round session. And informally, so you'll see phone consults taking place and sometimes even corridor consults. If you're passing someone in the corridor in hospital and you, you know that you need to talk to them about a patient, you might mention it there and then. Um, so the minimum requirements in a handover, um, when you're speaking to someone or writing a letter, you need to clearly identify who you are and your role, and you also need to clearly identify who the patient is. 
we need to state the immediate clinical situation of the patient. So is this an emergency or is the patient stable? You need to provide the background or the history of the patient's clinical situation so that whoever you're referring to can start to build a picture of the patient in their head. You need to list the most recent and important observations. You need to identify assessments and recommendations for action which need to occur. Um, it's also important to identify a time frame um, and requirement for transition of care. So if you're if if it's an urgent case and you're sending the patient up to the emergency department or if it's a referral letter that you're referring someone to a specialist. Um, so if you're referring someone up to a cardiologist for example and you think that um, they need to be seen fairly urgently because they potentially have um, angina um, then you need to obviously identify that in your letter so the cardiologist knows what's expected of them. Um, it's a good idea to promote the use of the patient record to cross-check information and as Lawrence has talked about in his, um, in his presentation that there's new ways of that happening within the IT systems we're using. So ensure that everyone understands what's happening and that the, the receiving clinician is accepting handover so there is no confusion. Barriers to effective handover. Um, can either of you think of any barriers which might um, impede an effective handover that you can think of, which you've experienced? I think sometimes it maybe just a lack of awareness for people that have never, uh, just from my point of view, like people that have never worked as a GP, sometimes just forget to tell you what's going on and um, mm. you're the one that sees the patient the most. So recently I had, I just was CC'd into a letter by one psychiatrist to a patient saying, oh, you didn't come for your appointment and I'm just checking why and I'm handing over your care to the other psychiatrist. But, um, you know, and then I, re and I had a discharge letter from Katoomba Hospital saying, oh, she's been admitted for um, mental health problems and change, change over medication. So then I emailed both the psychiatrists to say, oh, she didn't come to your appointment because she's actually in hospital. And then the other psychiatrist wrote back, oh, sorry, I sent her there and, Oh, here's the letter and like filling me in on all this care that I should have known about but you know it was it was she's it was very um, helpful but it just made me realize that if people are not working in primary care they just may not be aware mm. that um, that amount of information is really critical to you looking after the patient well anyway it all turned out fine but that was an example <laughs> thank you um, so yeah content emissions and errors can be a barrier um, incomplete or unclear communication, that's a good example you've just explained of that, Miriam. A lack of a shared understanding. Um, interruptions and distractions, so I think this often goes more for if it's a face-to-face -face or a telephone consult or handover, um, yeah, that can really get in the way of that being a, a clear uh, transition. So effective hierarchy and power. Mm. Um, so I guess if you're the, the intern who's calling the consultant in the middle of the night, that can sometimes get in the way of an effective handover and lack of training. So we'll talk about ways in which to um, overcome these barriers. I just, want to, oh, I just wanted to say something about timing, which kind of is a bit like what Miriam was saying, but um, sometimes we get told about stuff too late after it's already mm. happened. So I remember someone um, had a stillborn in hospital and then went to see her GP and the GP didn't know about that until the patient told them but you know mm. should have been better prepared mm. for that if the, if the handover had been done earlier. But even in hospital sometimes you're not sure should I tell the registrar now or should I wait for another few hours and see if the patient improves. Sometimes it's better to tell them earlier rather than waiting till later. Yeah. And when you're in hospital and you become more senior, always treat your junior staff well because if they stop calling you for advice because they're intimidated by you, then the patient's going to suffer. That's Miriam's plug. <laughs> it's true. So, uh, hypothetical scenario, it's Friday at four o'clock. You're busy, you're trying to wrap things up for the weekend. 
and you have Mrs Mac who's just walked into your GP consulting room. So she's a 42 year old female who presents with abdominal pain. She has a past medical history of chronic liver disease which is due to alcohol. She doesn't look well um, and after assessment you decide she needs to be seen in the emergency department and start planning a referral. So I just want you to think about what um, steps are going to be necessary to take at this point because I think there's going to be a few things that you'll need to think about doing. So when we're handing over from primary care into secondary or tertiary care, generally we'll write a letter. If it's an urgent case, we'll often call the emergency department and tell them what's happening. Um, so that they're aware, particularly if it's a very sick patient. So in this communication, you need to identify the patient and their contact details. Um, it's often useful if, probably not in the emergency setting, but just to clarify um, what their entitlement is to their healthcare, um, particularly if they're public or private, that makes a difference when they're going to rooms. Um, details of the referring doctor and the date of referral. The presenting issue, so a history of that, um, what you've already tried to do, and also including recent test results can be really useful. So it's also a good idea just to put a line of why you're referring the patient and what you're hoping for help with um, and what expectations you have um, within that referral. And other details, so if the patient, um, if you think there's something that might be sensitive that the patient might not automatically volunteer, which you think will be a really important piece of information for the doctor um, or the team who's going to be managing that patient, then it's often useful to write that into the letter. Um, you always put um, their past medical history, their current medication and allergies, the degree of urgency of the referral, Hello, Dr. Rosso. Dr. Rosso, ah, good. I've got a lady here who has just vomited another 500 mils of blood and she's looking pretty crook. Her blood pressure is difficult to get. I know she's a binge drinker and I think you need to take her now. I think this is varices. I don't think it's of ulcer, though it could be, but she has risk factors for varices. I did do her bloods, but they're not back yet. And, um, I haven't yet given antibiotics. Hang on, hang, hang on. Who are you and why are you calling? Okay, so within secondary care, New South Wales Health uses ISPAR. You might have come across that already. Um, it's a really effective mnemonic to use when you're doing a handover, particularly in this situation when it's the middle of the night and you're waking someone up who might um, take a minute to sort of come to and um, yeah, sort of start processing what it is you're telling them. Um, so it's always a good idea to introduce yourself and set that context and then describe the situation. So, you know, I'm Dr. So-and-so, I'm calling from this hospital um, about the background of the patient. So about this patient who is 42, who has a history of chronic liver disease due to alcohol excess. And then talk about your current assessment. Um, so what's the patient's current observations and um, other clinical assessment details and your recommendations. So in this situation, um, you're recommending that um, the, the surgeon or the gastroenterologist comes in to help you manage these viruses that are bleeding. So that's always a good one to remember. Um, uh, write it down and start practicing that one because it's pretty, um, pretty simple and widely used. Sorry, let me start again. Sorry, I'm Mark Williams, the overnight CMO at Maitland Hospital. I am calling because I have a patient who I think needs to transfer to John Hunter as soon as possible. And? Why? Well, she's... The situation is that a 42-year-old female with signs of chronic liver disease presented here about two hours ago with pre-syncopal symptoms after hematemesis and Melina at home. 
On arrival, she was tachycardic and hypotensive, but responded well to fluids. We were working her up as a variceal bleed when she had this further, large hematemesis. She's now looking shocked again, with a pulse of 110 and a BP of about 80 on 50, and we are about to start a unit of blood, a PPI and some oxyotide. On exam, there is no evidence for CITES, so I haven't started antibiotics. And... No other background story known at this stage, other than 10 years of high alcohol intake of about 60 grams a day and a 30-pack a year history of smoking. She's not had much in the way of investigation for her disease yet, although she does say that her GP told her that drinking had caused severe damage. There is no evidence of cardiac failure. Her ECG just shows sinus tacky, so I don't think that she's had an alcoholic cardiomyopathy or active ischemic heart disease to complicate things. So you're thinking that... I think she's had a variceal bleed and needs urgent endoscopy and banding if that's the case. I would like to transfer her to the John Hunter under your care so she can have an urgent scope. Given the distance and her current status and risk of continual bleeding, I think I should arrange this with the retrieval team. Are you happy to accept her and for retrieval to get involved? Sure. Sure, I agree. She needs to come down. Look, you get onto the retrieval team and why don't you call me back after you've lined it up with them. See from that case that it went from a fairly garbled amount of information of um, the, the doctor who sounded a bit flustered in an emergency situation trying to call and hand over the patient, but once it was structured into that ISBAR format, it became much clearer and um, there was a much more smooth handover in that respect. So the patient was fixed and she's now going home and so we're going to talk about what we actually need from a discharge summary when the patient's being transferred from the hospital into general practice. So it's always um, really important to put uh, the reason for admission and a diagnosis on there. Um, we need to know the dates generally when they were admitted and what date they were discharged. Um, it's uh, useful to put on who the clinician was responsible for the patient's care so that if there's any follow-up information required then that doctor can be contacted. Notable events, so obviously in this patient's case the fact that she had a massive variceal bleeding required transfer onto a tertiary centre would have been a notable event. So discharge plans. So the patient's medication when that they've been discharged on, if this has changed at all from their admission medication list and reasons why, that's really important to put on there. And also any follow-up which has been arranged um, for the patient. So if she's going to see someone in clinic, and that's useful to put the date on there as well so the doctor knows, um, the GP knows what's happening there. So it's also useful to put on any um, GP tasks that you would, you would like us to do. So if there's any follow-up bloods are probably the most common ones that we would be asked to check, particularly in a patient who's maybe had acute renal failure, which has um, settled down and they just want um, more bloods just to check that that's the case. Um, do either of you have any recent um, experiences? Um, well, Lauren, she talked about your um, list of tests that you thought weren't actually that well, useful. Well, yeah, it's a patient that went to hospital with a headache and high blood pressure, and they did a CT scan and um, discovered the patient had an opacity in the maxillary sinus, mm -hmm. and so they started the patient on antibiotics and suggested an ENT referral, which I think was a bit of overkill, because we don't normally send people to an ENT surgeon for sinusitis, mm -hmm. and he didn't actually have symptoms of sinusitis, it was an unrelated headache. Yeah. So, um, but it was good that they had done the tests and I had the results yeah. and I could understand why they started it on the yeah. and, and um, I talked to the patient and we both agreed that it wasn't really necessary to spend $200 sure. on ENT specialists sure. at this stage. Sure. Well, I think that's the other important thing, like, um, in that situation is a recommendation and obviously the patient's condition may also change between them being discharged and them seeing you and, you know, you have to take in your own clinical judgment into account when you're seeing the patient.
Um, but it is useful if there is things like that to put a list on there. So tips for handover. Plan what you're going to say or write. Even if it's an unscheduled one, just take a moment to gather your thoughts and piece together the story of the patient in a way that's logical. I think this was demonstrated quite well in that in the video that you've just watched. And paint a clear, contextual and holistic picture of the patient. When you're um, making a referral, don't assume the recipient knows anything about the patient. Um, and they should be able to do their part in managing the patient without necessarily having known or seen them before um, as a result of what you tell them. Give relevant information. So relevance depends on who you're communicating to and why. Your sense of what is relevant will change as you progress in your level of experience and knowledge of medicine. So when you're an intern, you'll probably give a lot of information, whereas when you're a senior registrar or specialist, you'll probably give, you'll be very succinct because you'll know what is relevant at that time. And that's okay. It's good probably to give more information than you need to rather than too little at your stage and it will change as your experience grows. Um, so yeah. And as I've mentioned at the end there, don't stress if there's something you miss. If you haven't mentioned it and they want to know it, they will ask. So take home messages from this talk. The healthcare system is large and fragmented and a patient is likely to go through different parts of the system in their healthcare journey. Clinical handover is necessary to achieve this is you're not going to be the only person looking after that patient all of the time. So without appropriately communicated clinical handover, the patient's safety can actually be threatened. And there are tools and principles um, to consider that we can improve the process of clinical handover and therefore improve patient outcomes. Useful references there if you want to read any of them.